Well, tonight is Erev Yom Kippur. It is more popularly known as Kol Nidre, the passage we sang at the beginning of the service. So why is this sacred service known by one passage? Is it because its message is clear and universally respected? I know some of you out there are saying, because they made a stand for like 20 minutes without sitting down. <laughs> well, after all, Kol Nidre is recited three times, yes, standing, sung in a haunting melody while the congregation stands and the rabbis and lay leaders hold Sifrei Torah. The Torah scrolls held by leaders creates a bait deen a court by which we give each other permission to annul vows and to pray together no matter how far one has transgressed. Though it is one of the most memorable parts of our Jewish liturgy, the development and acceptance of Kol Nidre has been controversial throughout the ages and continues to be so. Technically, Kol Nidre is not a prayer. It does not contain a direct mention of God. It makes no reference to repentance. Rather, it is a legal formula dating back at least to the ninth century that seeks to cancel our vows, both past and, and future. The earliest version of Kol Nidre is in the Talmud, written in Hebrew and recited right before Rosh Hashanah, not Yom Kippur. Over time, Aramaic replaced the Hebrew, and it was moved to Yom Kippur to align it with the theme of forgiveness and repentance. So let's look again briefly at parts of the text that we just recited earlier today. Kol Nidre, all vows, we said, that we promise and swear to God and take upon ourselves from this Yom Kippur to the next Yom Kippur. May it find us well. We regret them and repent. Let them all be discarded and forgiven, abolished and undone. They are not valid and they are not binding. Our vows shall not be vows. Our resolves shall not be resolves. And our oaths shall not be oaths. As we read and listen to the words, it becomes quite Easy to guess that Kol Nidre did not enter our liturgical lore without serious debate. Some of Judaism's most influential rabbinic sages have opposed the inclusion of Kol Nidre. And when they couldn't eliminate it, they tried to change it. And for the most part, they failed. So what was and is the problem? Well, for starters, the Torah and the Talmud emphasize the importance of keeping our word. We're commanded not to make a vow, and if we cannot keep it, then don't make such a vow. If a person makes a vow unto God or takes an oath imposing a personal obligation, that person shall not break the pledge. One must carry out all that has crossed that person's lips. That's in the Torah, in the book of Numbers. In addition, in the Talmud, they're not one, but there are two tractates devoted specifically to the importance of either not making vows, and if you do make a vow, to be sure you honor and keep up and live up to them. The Kol Nidre found itself in the earliest of the prayer books that we have in our possession. It's the Seder Rav Amram it's from the 9th century Babylonian Gaon, or sage. It is a declaration for canceling vows from last Yom Kippur to this one. Now, it's important to note that though he included it in his book, Rav Amram objected to the practice. He called it Minhag Shtut. Now, Minhag is custom. Shtut, or as the Ashkenazic pronounces a little bit nicer, Shtus. It sounds and it means exactly as it sounds. <laughs> Rabbeinu Tam, the 12th century, that means he didn't like it. The rabbinic, uh, rabbinic scholar and the grandson of Rashi insisted that the wording of Kol Nidre should only reflect vows in the future, not the past. So he changed it. His version has greatly influenced many, if not most, of the versions that we have, including ours, but not all. There are many traditional versions that include a version of Kol Nidre that has both the past vows and the future vows. 
Rabbeinu Tam believed that framing this passage in the future elevated the message, making it a noble plea for indulgence in case of a moment of future weakness. It was an acknowledgement that a person might make a rash promise, a vow that was impossible to keep. Now, while many commentators have accepted his reasoning, it still presents a troubling ethical dilemma. Does reciting kol nidre mean that a person has the right to break his or her word? What do you think? It's no. <laughs> Apologists are quick to insist that this nullification of vows only deals with promises concerning a personal vow. It has no effect on vows imposed by the courts or by other individuals. Swear to me that you're going to do this. Well, if you swear to that person, you got to live up to it. That is, I can swear a personal vow, like I will not watch television in the coming year, but soon discover that that vow is a little bit too hard for me to live up to, and so therefore I break it. But if I swear a vow to another person, I am not free to break it whatsoever. And Kol Nidre does not give me a get out of jail free card. The controversy of Kol Nidre has caused many to recommend eliminating it from the Moxor, the High Holiday Prayer Book. Indeed, early Reform Judaism did just that. Those of you who grew up like I did in Reform Judaism, remember the old Union Prayer Book, the small little black one? Well, that did not have Kol Nidre in it. And later text actually had a little line saying, Kol Nidre can be, can be sung here, but it didn't have a text. It wasn't until 1978 with Chaim Stern and the Gates of Repentance that Kol Nidre was included with the text. It has been suggested that the popularity of the beautiful music is what has prevented Kol Nidre from being eliminated. Well, if you think about it, that may be the case, but that doesn't make any sense because we can change the words and keep the melody. Regardless, Kol Nidre, with all of its ambivalence, remains the beloved beginning of our Day of Atonement. Ambivalence, having mixed feelings or contradictory ideas about something, is not a sign of weakness or confusion. Rather, ambivalence can arise from the acknowledgement that human beings are not binary. Our thoughts, our perspectives, and the choices we make cannot be easily and neatly categorized as good or bad. Why? Because we're complex beings. Humans are created, as the sages poetically described it, with a yetzer tov and a yetzer hara, both a good and an evil inclination. Our thoughts and actions reflect the interaction of both. We need both. In the Talmud, it was written about a certain community that had all the sages dedicated to stamping out all evil and evil thoughts in their community. And so they fasted and they prayed and they said, we will get rid of the evil inclination. And they fasted and they prayed for three days. Whereupon the Yetzahara, that evil inclination, surrendered. One of the rabbis with them warned that, you know, if you destroy the Yetzahara, the entire world might perish. Nevertheless, they imprisoned the evil inclination for three days. Afterwards, they searched throughout the land and they could find nothing new, not even a fresh egg. The Midrashic collection called Bereshit Rabbah amplifies that teaching, noting that without the Yetzir Hara, marriages would not take place, children would not be conceived, and houses would not be built. That is, a little bit of our lustful, competitive, egotistic, and even greedy desires are a part of our complex package of qualities. Each person possesses different perspectives and often conflicting opinions. Think about yourself. Inconsistent? Sure. Unpredictable? Absolutely. Capable of thoughts and actions that are generous and kind one minute and selfish and mean the next? Well, this too, if we're honest, we have to admit to. Our conflicting and com 
competing feelings, perceptions, and reactions are in tension. And how well we manage that tension is what determines our character. That tension can be traced to a peculiar design of our brain. Specifically, it's played out in the interaction between our right hemisphere brain and the left hemisphere of our brain. In Ian McGilchrist's magisterial book, The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World, it's a hard slog. It's long and it's technical, but if you've read it, it's awesome. He lays out the essential differences between the brain's two hemispheres. At the risk of gross simplification, the left hemisphere is the seat of languages and systematic thought. It perceives the world in a linear fashion. The right hemisphere, which is larger, perceives the broader context. It pays attention to the other, whatever is out there that exists apart from ourselves. McGilchrist offers an important caveat. Ideally, these two hemispheres are not in competition. Rather, they are necessary complements and partners. Unfortunately, there are certain times and eras and climates like ours that favor one form of thinking over the other. Modern society, our modern society, too often treats apparent inconsistency as a sign of error or intellectual incompetence. Ambiguity is no longer considered a strength. Rather, it is a quality that embraces complexity and nuance. The modern tendency is to determine absolute truth, identifying it as something simple and straightforward. McGilchrist presents scientific findings that place the preference for linear thinking and straight lines to the brain's left hemisphere. It is, the left is, the seat of language and of mathematics. It tries to unpack the world and understand it through formulas and exact measurements and with the self as the constant reference point. As essential as those skills are, we know that there are no straight lines in the natural world. It's a strange concept. There are no straight lines in the natural world. Space itself, Einstein proved, was curved, is curved. Reducing the world to simple, straight, and linear descriptions leads to distortion. Placing oneself at the center or the starting point of those descriptions is a formula for egomania. Cognition on the right hemisphere is not a process of something coming into being through a sequence. Rather, the right hemisphere sees and considers a much broader spectrum. Things are understood within a context, the whole and not the atomized part. Now, there's a Kabbalistic expression. You know, the Kabbalists anticipated this brain theory by centuries. The Kabbalists have said that there are two mutually exclusive perspectives. One is the mochin de gadlut, or the expansive mind, one that sees the big picture one that McGilchrist would assign to the right hemisphere. On the other hand, there's the mochin de katnut from katan, for small, the narrow mind that sees the world through the prism of the self. Is it good for me? Can I benefit from it? Does it matter to me? That's the de katnut, the small, narrow, self-referential perspective. The narrow mind sees the world as binary, I, thou. Us, them, down, up, good, and evil, while the expansive mind sees in the larger frame of non-duality. As Rabbi Rami Shapiro expresses, to the narrow mind, everything is other. To the spacious or expansive mind, everything is one. He maintains that the sages of rabbinic literature, like Pirkei Avot, aim to help us see beyond the narrow self-focus in order to perceive the interconnectedness, the oneness of life. It is a unity that understands that God is one, the one from which all exists, not one being over there, for that is how the narrow or linear mind sees it. I'm here, so the other must be there. 
Rather, the expansive mind sees all as interconnected, all as in relationship. Instead of mine and yours, mine versus yours, the expansive non-binary sees ours. Nothing is separate from God. Rather, all is of God. Purely linear thinking has dehumanizing quality. As McGilchrist concludes, left brain dominance leads to alienation. It favors the categorical versus the unique and the part versus the whole. We have certainly witnessed evidence of this binary thinking. It has now become common to divide people into hard categories. Politically, some aim to divide us into left wing and right wing, conservative and liberal, as if one cannot have a complex political or social ideology that spans one category or the other. The terms left and right themselves are reflective of a narrow mind, of a binary. The damage of these forced and imposed categories has contributed to the breakdown of governance in Washington, where partisanship rules and those brave few who dare to venture across party lines are vilified. And it has extended to our personal relationships, friendships broken because of the narrow focus of, if you are not with me, you are against me. We see the narrow mind triumph as well in those who wish to divide all into categories of race, as if a human being can be understood simply by looking at the color of his or her skin. And we see it with gender and sexuality. Again, how narrow-minded it is to define a person because of their sex, their gender, or with whom they fall in love. The point being is that the world is not binary. We are being manipulated by those who stand to profit either monetarily or by acquiring power or by both. By dividing people, categorizing people, demonizing people and creating an us versus them culture. Instead of dividing ourselves into smaller and smaller groups, atomizing the community, and reducing a complex person to a statistic, modern Judaism embraces the expansive mind's appreciation of the ambivalent. Like Kol Nidre, a person is filled with contradictions. Kol Nidre has been so beloved by our people that the greatest of sages could not remove it, that it simultaneously addresses the past and the future is no problem. Don't we all? Isn't it natural to be both reflective, nostalgic even, and eager to experience what is next in store? That Kol Nidre expresses regret for past errors and anticipates future errors, that's not a contradiction. Rather, it is true to our life experiences. And we say with contrite hearts, we have sinned before you, knowing that we will not be perfect in the year to come. But this admission is not a sign of cynicism or defeatism. Rather, it is an awareness of the complexity of our being, the complexity of life, and the determination to do our best without pretensions or false promises. This year has begun, much like last year, with uncertainty in the face of a prolonged pandemic. Of all the things that we have learned, perhaps the most valuable is that nothing in life is predictable. There are no straight lines. We have learned to creatively address new challenges, and we have learned to embrace the ambivalent because so-called certainty is false. We have learned to roll with the punches. We've learned to, to call futility, identify futility, and stop being frustrated over things that we cannot control. 
No matter how much we plan, no matter how much technology we put into place, when Comcast goes down, the broadcast is over. <laughs> In this coming year, let us strive to keep opening our minds to a broader perspective. There's no use seeking someone to blame for all of our problems and disappointments. Yes, life is complex, but it is not complicated. Live, learn, grow, and experience this marvelous gift of life with an open heart and an open mind and a joyful spirit. In doing so, we are wowed by the complexity of life, not overwhelmed by it. We become appreciative of life's ambiguities and not frustrated by them. With a slight adjustment of perspective and attitude, a shift to a more expansive worldview, and we will begin to see those around us not as others, but as brothers and sisters. On this night of Kol Nidre, when we consider that our words and thoughts, our promises and hopes, carry with them dimensions of feelings and meaning that transcend a simple and linear definition, then we can be more understanding and forgiving of others and, God willing, of ourselves. Kenya Ratzon. May it be God's will. <laughs>